welcome everyone to the webcast on the necessity defense and climate disobedience. We're so happy to have you all here and our speakers. I'm Anne, I'm from Stand Out Earth. Facilitating our webcast today is my colleague at Stand Out Earth, Matt Krogh. Matt is our Extreme Oil Campaign Director and he joined Stand in August of 2013 to direct a new campaign targeting tar sands on the west coast of North America uh, called Tar Sands SOS. Matt was the North Sound Baykeeper at Resources for Sustainable Communities in Bellingham, Washington, where he fought against Gateway Pacific and other proposed coal terminals on the west coast. And Matt, thank you so much for facilitating today. And um, I'm gonna let you take it away. Uh, thanks so much, Anne. Can you hear me okay? Anybody? Yeah, good, thanks. Uh, again, my name is Matt Krogh. I direct our extreme oil campaign here at STAN. We do quite a bit of work on pipelines, uh, oil trains, oil train offloading facilities, and other sort of climate-related work. Um, but uh, I'm going to introduce our full panel, uh, panelists, excuse me, uh, in the order in which they're going to speak, um, and then we're going to do Q&A after that. Um, but before I introduce them, I just want to note that uh, uh, we did extend invitations to a few leaders who couldn't join us today, including Chase Ironheart a Standing Rock Sioux tribal member, an attorney, a water protector, uh, who's also pursuing the necessity defense in the face of charges of uh, setting a riot and criminal trespass for his activism against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, necessity defense is also being pursued by other indigenous water protectors at Standing Rock. And we want to know that these, you know, note that these people's cases are other important examples to track and learn from. Uh, and especially as we acknowledge the inequities in our legal system, our law enforcement, our court systems, such experienced by people who are indigenous, people of color, and, and other marginalized groups. So um, I want to start with that and then to launch into introductions. First, uh, Kelsey Skagg, an attorney and co-founder and executive director of the Climate Defense Project. It's a legal nonprofit that serves climate activists. Born and raised in Alaska, uh, she's seen the impact of climate change firsthand and is working in the areas of environmental law, freedom of expression, family law, international human rights law, uh, and all that in the United States, UK, and Switzerland. It's, it's a lot. Kelsey, thank you so much for, uh, for being with us. Uh, Marla Marbon, uh, co-founder of the Climate Disobedience Center and the United Methodist, who is committed to supporting people of all faiths, or no particular faith, uh, to act boldly for justice. Marla has supported, organized, and participated in many direct actions and civil disobedience efforts, including the Lobster Road blockade uh, and the campaign of sustaining nonviolent resistance to Spectra Energy's West Roxbury Lateral Pipeline Project with Resist the Pipeline. So welcome, Marla. And Jay, also co-founder of the Climate Disobedience Center and a Quaker from Cape Cod, uh, called the Boulder Act in 2013 along with Ken Ward. He blockaded 40,000 tons of coal. That's a lot of coal, by the way. Uh, Destined for the Brayton Point Power Plant with their small white lobster boat named the Henry David T. And that's also the lobster boat blockade. Um, the ensuing legal proceedings started national attention, and the plant, the coal plant, ended up closing its doors in 2017. Uh, in 2016, he supported the Tar Sands Valve Turners, uh, their actions across the four states, and continues to support the, the valve, turners, valve turners in their trial period. And then finally, uh, Ben Zoldersma, a climate activist with 350CL, the software engineer. Um, ben is facing two. Is that right, two felony charges? Yeah, um, for his role supporting Val Turner's Emily Johnson and Annette Klapstein in a Minnesota action. So, welcome, Ben. So, thank you all again so much for being here. Uh, again, we'll go in the order of those introductions. And so, Kelsey, starting with you, tell us about the necessity defense. What do we need to know? Okay, thanks, Matt um, and Anne, for having me. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up? Thank you. Um, so first of all, I'm going to tell you some legal stuff, but none of this is legal advice. Um, if you or your organization or campaign has specific questions about using the climate necessity defense, um, please contact my organization, Climate Defense Project. Um, we'll put my email address in the chat or something. Um, I would definitely encourage folks to seek individualized advice, which this is not. Um, so the necessity defense, um, it's part of criminal law and a successful defense of necessity exonerates a defendant who has committed a crime in order to avoid a greater harm. So you plead not guilty, but you don't focus on a technical argument like, I didn't actually trespass on this pipeline company's land. 
Instead, you say, this is what I did, and this is why it was justified. And on that basis, a judge or jury can find you not guilty by reason of necessity. So to understand the argument, imagine that you are walking down the street and you come upon a house that's on fire and you hear a baby crying inside. Now, you don't have permission to go in the house, but you go in anyway and you rescue the child. You just trespassed but you probably wouldn't be found guilty by a jury, even if you tell the jury, yeah, I did go in the house. There were other things that you could have done, like calling the fire department, but if the house is already in flames, that realistically might not have saved the child. So you did what was necessary. The necessity defense is old law. It's part of the common law that came over to uh, the US from England. Common law is judge-made law that develops through cases. Um, and so the old examples include things like a ship captain who was caught in a storm and threw his cargo overboard to avoid sinking. And he was prosecuted for throwing away that valuable cargo, but he was found not guilty because it was necessary. And today, the necessity defense has also been codified as a statute in many different jurisdictions. Most states have um, a written statutory law as well as the common law um, that addresses the necessity defense. And it has been used by activists in the past, um, including in various US social movements. Um, for example, in the 1980s, there was a group including Amy Carter, the former president's daughter, who were arrested for protesting CIA activities in Central America. And they argued the necessity defense and were found not guilty. Uh, it's also been used by anti-nuclear activists in the US um, and even in a case involving a protest against air pollution, it was used successfully. Now, in climate change cases, we use the defense to argue that civil disobedience is morally and legally justified because other means of affecting change have failed to bring about realistic, livable climate change policy and because this has catastrophic ramifications. Okay, this is the actual law part. Um, so you have to prove several elements. Um, you can't just go in and say, I was justified because I know that climate change is really bad or because I feel like it. Um, the elements vary slightly depending on the jurisdiction, but in general, you have to show four things. First, that the defendant faced a serious danger. In some jurisdictions, it has to be an imminent danger. Second, that the defendant took action to prevent that danger through less harmful means. So lesser of two evils is another name for this defense. Um, third, that the defendant reasonably expected that the action would prevent the danger, had a reason to think that it would be effective what they were doing. Um, and fourth, that they had no reasonable lawful alternative. So when applied to climate change cases, the imminent danger requirement is, or it should be pretty easy. Climate change is already happening. There's clearly an overwhelming catastrophic harm that activists are trying to prevent. Uh, but we do get prosecutors and sometimes judges saying, this isn't really imminent, it's still in the future. Uh, and that drives our climate scientists up the wall because, of course, climate change is beyond imminent. It's happening now. In terms of the second element, the less harmful means, that's fairly straightforward because trespassing or even shutting down a pipeline is clearly not nearly as bad as climate change. Um, in terms of the efficacy requirement, we argue that civil disobedience is clearly an effective way to promote policy change, and there are plenty of examples through that, about that um, throughout US and world history. Um, and then finally, the fourth element, that there is no reasonable, lawful alternative available to the defendant. Um, now, a lawful alternative is something that you would do to affect change short of breaking the law. But the stark problem is that our government is responsive to industry interests, as we know, not to people. Um, so regular citizens can't out lobby the fossil fuel industry and the legal means have all been tried um, probably by lots of people on this webinar um, and so far haven't been successful in getting the climate policy that we need. Um, 
but this is usually the trickiest element for the defense, and that's for a couple of reasons. First, um, prosecutors and judges sometimes interpret reasonable alternative to mean any alternative. But a reasonable alternative is one that has an actual logical chance of being effective. So if none of the lawful things that you can do have a reasonable chance of success, then they don't count. But we do get judges saying things like, this defendant should have just written to the representatives again, or run an ad campaign to raise awareness about climate change. Um, and second, there is a pretty common misconception that the defendant has to have herself exhausted all of the lawful alternatives. That's not the legal standard. Um, sometimes we do explain that the defendant or the campaign that they're part of has tried many different tactics before turning to civil disobedience because it bolsters our argument to show that none of those things worked. And it helps the jury understand how this person got to the point of breaking the law. But there is no requirement that the defendant personally try everything else first. So those are the elements of the necessity defense in brief. Um, and I'm happy to talk later about how exactly we prove those elements if people have questions. Um, but in general, it's, it's a good fit in climate cases because there's clearly an overwhelming harm that climate activists are trying to prevent. And it's equally clear that our government isn't going to solve it on their own and the other means of bringing about change aren't working. Um, and it's also a good fit because climate change and the government and industry actions that further it are moral issues. And the necessity defense is part of criminal law, but it's also a moral argument. And it asks the jury to make assessments about individual responsibility, about governmental obligation, and about the good of society. So it can really change the focus of the trial from the prosecution of an individual for, for example, trespass to a trial about the real issues of climate change and what we should be doing about it. Um, in terms of the history of climate necessity defense, in 2008, six climate activists in the UK were acquitted on the basis of the climate necessity defense. Um, in the US, we've attempted to present the defense in a variety of cases since then, and mostly in the last five years. So it's still very early in the development of this area of law. Um, we have not yet had a case in which a US judge fully allowed the jury to consider all of the necessity evidence that we wanted to present, but we've gotten pretty close in a number of different ways and have had good outcomes short of that. Um, and we have some exciting cases coming up. So I'm happy to talk about any of those specific cases, but I think I'll let my co-presenters start us off. Awesome, thanks so much, Kelsey. That was, that was super great. Um, so let's move, uh, just to remind folks that, uh, one second please, uh, just to remind folks that we are gonna have each of the presenters go through, we've got four total presenters. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we will take questions or questions and, and discussion and answer and whatnot. Um, if you're on Facebook Live, you can put those questions in the comment section in Facebook. Um, or if you're on Zoom, uh, you, should, you might need to expand your screen, but you'll see that there's a folder that says Q&A at the bottom. Uh, and you can type your questions into the Q&A. And again, we'll, we'll gather those together uh, and, and go through them all at the end. Um, and also, when, when you do ask a question, if, you have a particular presenter you want to hear from, make sure that you name them. Uh, so thanks so much, Kelsey, and let's move on to Marla Markham from the Climate Disobedience Center. Marla, take it away. Hi, Hi friends. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to be with you all. Uh, I, there's so many things I suppose that we could talk about if we're going to talk about the, um, the, the efforts in West Roxbury that led to a climate trial, but um, I think I want to highlight just a few really um, important things that I think we focused on that, that helped us uh, sustain our campaign and, um, and get all the way to trial. Uh, so uh, the first thing is just to say that we were fighting a really short lateral pipeline that was part of a larger project. 
in the West Roxbury neighborhood of Boston. Um, and as I talk, I'm gonna share some of the photos of some of the, the, the stuff so you can get a feel of what it was like. Um, and uh, so we didn't have a long time to fight it once it began because, uh, because you know, the, the segments were short. And so, uh, so we, did, but, and we also decided because all of the construction, except for a very short segment that went across the soccer field, was happening in busy city streets, we decided that um, we knew we couldn't have any kind of encampment, but we wanted to have a sustained presence. So we decided to see if we could have a sustained campaign of just action after action after action over a long time for the entire um, extent of of the construction and we ended up being able to do that so um, so one thing that we did is decide that we wanted to from the beginning if we could try to get a necessity defense case um, at the end of this that'd be great we were mostly trying to stop this pipeline um, but but we did a lot of work to try to build sort of community among folks and to help people um, understand the process sort of start to finish that might happen if we engaged in necessity defense and um, and helped people really do a lot of good work around jail support and court support because people were in court for a long, long time. Um, in total, we had 198 arrests over the course of um, about eight months of active actions. Um, and, uh, and in the end, we had 13 people who were still, who still had open cases and were headed toward trial. Um, one thing that I think it's important to know is if you, if you're going to try to get to trial, to jury trial, um, one of the things that's going to happen along the way is that you, um, you're going to go through a process called discovery where you can ask a judge to order um, the pipeline company maybe, maybe the contractors who are building it, maybe the police to produce documents that can help you um, defend yourself. And one thing that was really important for us is that we figured out that um, the pipeline company had been claiming for years that they had a safety plan for this particular pipeline. And um, by the time that we got to trial, uh, the pipeline had actually been in service for a year and a half and the city of Boston was still fighting it in federal court trying to get um, a ruling for FERC to um, re, uh, reconsider their permit of the project. And the city of Boston police and fire commissioners were both um, on record publicly as being very upset about not having access to any sort of safety plan. And so we were able to convince a judge uh, to, order, uh, to order Spectra Energy, which is now Enbridge, to, uh, to produce that safety plan for an affidavit signed by an officer of the company uh, declaring that they didn't have one. And, um, but it, it literally took us almost a year and a half to, to, get, that, to get that from the judge. And so, um, so that, was, that was just something to know about that, that you could be going back to court once a month um, for a long time. And um, if it's really important for you to, to receive some of that information, even if it's not just important for your own defense, but it could possibly be important um, for your campaign or for your organizing efforts. So sometimes we can get in discovery um, documents that we couldn't otherwise get, perhaps. And um, so that's an important thing to think about as you head toward a necessity defense case or really any kind of court case. Um, and so in the end, it took people committing acts of civil disobedience and um, being in court for a year and a half in order for the city of Boston to find out that there was no safety plan um, on, on this pipeline. Um, it was also really important, uh, it ended up being really important for us to have been, we think, in court once a month for, for that long because we really developed a kind of relationship with the judge. It helped her to see that we weren't just pulling a stunt, you know, we were back every month 
month after month. And of course, um, as long as we were in discovery, Specter Energy's lawyer was there in addition to the prosecutor. And um, this ended up being a good strategy as well because um, this attorney is used to arguing in federal court um, and is not used to having to show up in a municipal courtroom and was very irritated about it and really condescending and nasty to the judge. And uh, I don't think that hurt us at all. And, um, and so not too long into our process, she started, I mean, she realized because we were asking for, for evidence that clearly you would only ask for if you were gonna mount a necessity defense. She realized that that's what we were working on and she ended up announcing to, um, to the Spectre Energy attorney um, who tried to instruct her that, that we weren't entitled to one, that, that she was sure that that was her call and that she had actually had conversations with one of her colleagues who served um, in another city in Massachusetts. Uh, and that colleague had uh, not very many years ago uh, granted a necessity defense for some protesters at Raytheon. And so she knew that it was her call and um, she, she seemed very clear all along that that was her, her plan. Um, and so as we approach our, our court date, and when, one really amazing thing happened when we decided to set a court date, uh, this judge combined, we had 15 at that time, two people ended up not being able to, to make our timeline. So, so two people dropped out, um, took a, a plea deal because they couldn't be there at the dates that we set for trial. But, but she ended up combining 15 cases which represented um, either four or five, I can't remember, different action dates, so different action scenarios, and um, which, uh, you know, our, we had been wanting to combine some of them, and our lawyers kept telling us there's no way you can combine, you can have more than six or maybe eight at once, and um, the judge just insisted that we combine them all, and so, um, so I, I think, you know, one thing that you know, uh, I was part of the, the group that supported the, the Delta Five when they went to trial. Um, I've done a lot of support work on some of the uh, Valve Turner's trials. I was on the support team for the lobster boat effort. And um, every time we work with a, with a necessity defense case, we recognize that even when we don't get the whole, the, to the goal, I think Kelsey just mentioned, we keep getting good outcomes, even when we don't say get, even we aren't allowed to present expert witnesses, but then when we are and we don't get the jury instruction, we continue to get excellent outcomes. And the very strange and excellent outcome we got in West Roxbury was that, um, so when two weeks in advance of the trial date, we submitted our list of expert witnesses. And a week before trial, the prosecution uh, decided that they were gonna drop the charges and so in response, we asked them if we could um, have civil infractions instead, which is like a parking ticket so that we could actually have a time in court. And, and I wanted us to do that as an organizing tool because part of the work of, of going to trial for a necessity defense, uh, in my mind, you best use that opportunity if we're using it for, for organizing and for building our base. Sometimes people will come into the movement or the work only at this moment when people are facing um, legal jeopardy for, for acts of conscience. And sometimes those people who wouldn't have ever shown up to cheer for you on the sidewalk while you were in the pipeline trench will show up to support you when you're in court. And so we had been attempting to like build a movement and get stronger um, so that we could keep fighting other pipelines, even though this one had gone into service. And, um, and so we wanted to see each other's faces because people were coming from, from lots of places around Boston and even a little further one last time and be all together. And so, uh, but then when we showed up on that day, um, like, like at a parking ticket hearing, we did have our same judge and um, the defendants asked her if they could speak, each telling her for two minutes why they did what they did. And she said yes. And then they asked her to find them not responsible by reason of necessity, um, which is the civil equivalent, the civil penalty equivalent of not guilty. And she did. And so there's a way in which they were acquitted with like a parking ticket um, on the basis of necessity by a judge, which is really exciting. And it's sort of a morale booster. It certainly doesn't have any 
um, legal precedent value. But uh, but I think for us, we learned a lot about the fact that um, when a judge actually allows herself to to listen herself to a lot of the evidence and to understand what's happening in her own community, there's a chance that she's going to see that that your actions were necessary. Um, and she said very clearly, you can listen to the audio. Uh, I believe these people believe their actions were necessary and I'm not going to, she said, I don't argue with it. So um, I'll, uh, I'll close with that. There's a lot of other things to talk about, but, um, but I'll wait for the question period. That's awesome, Marla. Thank you so much. And it's, it's super interesting hearing about the intersection between organizing and legal. Uh, looking forward to hearing more about that, or maybe we'll, we'll save it for the Q&A. Uh, just a reminder that we are doing Q&A at the end, but you can put your questions in the Q&A window in the Zoom um, interface. You might need to expand your uh, your screen or your Zoom your Zoom window to see that Q&A folder, or you can put questions in the Facebook chat window, and we'll, we'll get them from there. Um, so thanks again, Marla, and let's move on to Jay O'Hara from the Climate Disobedience Center. Jay, you ready to go? I am, yes. Uh, Matt, and to see it. Go for it. Matt, thanks, and Anne, thanks so much for having me. Um, also want to like tip my hat. I see Leonard Higgins is on the line, Valve Turner uh, from uh, Montana, and want to uh, thank him um, for, for doing what you do as well, Leonard. And I know Abby Brockway from the Delta Five um, uh, wanted to be here too. So um, just a note for those of you who do follow or are following these cases, the Delta Five uh, just yesterday uh, submitted uh, their appeal of their denial of the necessity defense, I believe, to the uh, Washington State Supreme Court. So we could have some interesting, fingers crossed, good uh, precedents, uh, at least in the U.S., uh, some state law around the necessity defense coming soon. Um, I'll, I'll share some screen uh, here for a, a couple pretty photos. Um, just want to let you know if you don't know the a short story about the lobster boat uh, in 2013 friend Ken Ward and I um, uh, piloted this cute little white lobster boat uh, which we renamed the Henry David T um, up to uh, the biggest power plant uh, biggest source of climate emissions in in the northeast the Brayton Point power station uh, in south uh, southeastern Massachusetts uh, Marla uh, was our lead support person uh, who was on the shore dealing with confused neighbors and uh, and the press um, dropped our anchor in front of the pier where that coal was supposed to be unloaded uh, and uh, had timed ourselves pretty well uh, to be a couple of hours ahead of a 400 foot long ship uh, coming up from Norfolk Virginia full with West Virginia's finest coal um, they were able to safely kind of half dock the ship on the dock, so there was no safety issues, uh, but they were not in a place that they could unload it. Um, we spent all day there in front of that, in front of that ship, staring it down. Um, and, uh, and then we're uh, under threat of massive fines, which we had not anticipated. We were expecting to get arrested, um, but under the threat of massive fines uh, and order from the Coast Guard uh, around 6 p.m., we, we well, I'll just keep it this. We got rid of our anchor uh, and, and departed under our own power uh, to be charged later um, by the state, uh, by the district attorney of Bristol County in Massachusetts. Um, a couple of things I wanna say about uh, leading up to that trial, I think for, for a lot of folks, I suspect it certainly was true for me, who take a, an act of conscience you don't do a lot of thinking beforehand of like, well, what are my legal options once I've done this thing? You're focused on the moral clarity of the act. You're focused on telling the story. You're focused on uh, doing the right thing. Uh, and it, it wasn't until several months after we got the charges that it really hit me of like, wow, there was a bunch of different options here that, that we could choose from about how to, how to respond to these charges. Um, charges we got were a couple of misdemeanors and a felony. Um, so they were, semi-serious they're pretty serious but they weren't actually they weren't anything like we had anticipated we were imagining that we could get federal patriot act charges for interfering with a national energy facility um, 
we can talk more about the strategy of trying to get some of those charges uh, maybe in the Q&A. Um, um, but that's kind of a moral quandary. Well, how do you respond? Well, I don't feel that I'm guilty. I feel that I'm pretty not guilty um, because I feel like I did the right thing. Um, but there's also this history in the in civil disobedience history, particularly Ga the Gandhian strain of nonviolence that says you go in and you plead guilty. I did the thing. This is me. If you think it's wrong, um, uh, sentence me to the highest uh, sentence possible. And if you think what I did was right, then find me not guilty. Um, and then dismiss the law, essentially. Um, that didn't feel right either because we were breaking a law that we actually thought was pretty, you know, we think, I think, uh, laws governing navigation on the seas are, are important. Um, and I don't dispute those laws. So we ended up stumbling upon this thing about the necessity of defense. Um, and, and first thing I wanna note is, note is that the necessity of defense is, as Kelsey said, is not a strategy to get out of the charges. Um, you are going to uh, face a higher risk you're going to be more vulnerable. Uh, this, of course, the, the idea of vulnerability flies in the face of um, everything that most lawyers are trained to think about. Um, but, uh, but that vulnerability opens up some of the amazing things that can happen from, from political trials using a necessity defense. In, in our case, in Ken and Mai's case, um, one of the things that we were able to do was mobilize constituencies that weren't previously mobilized around climate uh, and to create more of an intense focus on this particular power plant. Um, uh, we brought in a, actually a lot of uh, people of faith and clergy in particular. Um, I was able to mobilize my Quaker community in a way that I hadn't been able to before. Um, and, and that had some juice for it, some life for people because I and Ken were taking a vulnerable stand. There's, there's this elicited empathetic response for people who want to, want to support you um, that provides new opportunities for organizing. Um, the, just close out the quick, quick story for those who don't know it. Um, we uh, had went, gone in to, we had gotten permission to use a necessity defense. We had gone into court, um, however, expecting that the charges were going to be dropped. We'd gotten some hint of that uh, the week before in some pretrial motions, but um, we, as far as we knew, we were going to put on a, a necessity defense case when we went into court that Monday. Um, however, instead of just the pro prosecutor from the district attorney's office showing up, uh, the district, the elected district attorney himself, Sam Sutter, uh, was there uh, and essentially said that he couldn't, in good conscience, argue in court that what we did wasn't necessary, um, which was kind of an interesting about face, um, an interesting turn of events. Um, that change uh, both elicited this big press conference that you can see that we did. Um, we got some good media out of it. We made it a, we put climate change above uh, the, as the, the front top story uh, on the Boston Globe, front page of the Boston Globe. Uh, the next day, which was actually an election day, which is a pretty remarkable way to get climate change in the news. Um, and the way that happened is that said district attorney, Sam Sutter, while waving uh, one of Bill McKibben's Rolling Stone articles over his head, uh, said that he, that climate change is one of the biggest challenges humanity has ever faced, uh, that politicians had been um, derelict in their duty and that he would join us all in three weeks at the People's Climate March in New York City. Uh, which he, in fact, did. A um, couple things that I want to want to bring out, and um, just to kind of close this story, is beyond. Uh, well, I think one of the reasons that we got that sort of media attention, uh, not only that we had a, a man bites dog sort of story of the district attorney, the prosecutor who came out on the side of the defendants. Um, there was there's something about being able to tell a story in the context of a court of law that makes it a sort of privileged sort of information. People pay special attention to things, and the media in particular pay more attention to things that happen in a courtroom. 
Um, that gives us as climate campaigners the opportunity, particularly if we're able to present a full necessity defense with our expert witnesses, uh, to tell the full climate story with a longer attention span from those who are listening, uh, with the, the facts, the figures, and the reality um, of, of flesh and blood uh, witnesses and experts being able to testify to what's happening. Um, my hope is, and I think the, one of the strategies for this, um, yes, we would love to the media spectacle about climate change that, that would come from a full-throated sort of scopes monkey trial of climate. Um, but ultimately, as Kelsey was saying, we want to win one of these. And uh, my hope is that we can win one, get an acquittal, and that leads to a further opening of the floodgates of civil disobedience around climate change. Um, and lastly, I'll just say, as Marla was alluding to as well, um, so it's strange how these seem to all have some sort of special sauce. Something happens. There's some transformative juice that comes out of, out of these cases. And that was certainly the case with, with Sam Sutter. Uh, looking forward to talking with you all a little bit more. Uh, thanks for having me. Awesome, thank you so much, Jay, that, that, that's really great. And uh, the detailed stories are fun. Um, so, so now let's move to, to Ben, uh, again, Jolersma from Seattle 350. Um, and Ben, I, I expect you're gonna talk about this, but just in case you're not, um, we've heard from Jay about the valve turners and, and we know that you were there supporting Emily and Annette. If you can define up front what the valve turning action was, uh, just so people, people know about, about the, we know who's on the call right now. It would be great to have, make sure that we have the basics of that and uh, what it was all about. So Ben, go for it. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Matt. Um, so I'm just, my name is Ben Joldersma and uh, I, I'm with 350 Seattle. Um, and I was involved in 2016 in a climate action that was, uh, has kind of become known as the Valve Turner's action, I think is sort of the, or shut it down. Um, and it's, uh, it's an, it was an action that was designed to um, sort of shut down the flow of tar sands oil from uh, from Alberta into the US, um, pretty much like all of it for about a day. So it was an action that com that was con that consisted of shutting down five pipelines across four states. Um, and there were there were uh, five valve turners. Um, I I'm sort of a valve turner support person. Um, and so so uh, Emily and Annette shut down uh, lines uh, 60, sorry, line 63 and line three, I think, <laughs> um, uh, in, in Minnesota. Um, Michael Foster shut down the Keystone Pipeline in North Dakota. Uh, Ken Ward shut down the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline in, um, in Washington State. And, uh, and Leonard Higgins shut down um, the, uh, is it a Spectre Line in, um, in, in Montana, basically, uh, accounted for about 2.8 or 2.2 million barrels of, uh, of crude oil from, from Canada for, for about 24 hours. Um, yeah, so that's the action. My role was kind of in support of Emily and Annette. And we had, we, I'm just trying to think where to go with the necessity. Um, that actually was sort of an element that is, which maybe is a little bit different than uh, than Jay and Ken's. Maybe the, I think Ken being involved in both that both the lobster boat and and valve turner action kind of um, you know necessity was something that was discussed in advance and uh, and and was sort of um, an element of the uh, of the you know planning as far as like having it across multiple states um, and there was you know potentially some interest with the Obama presidency and having uh, you know having a federal case there. Um, in, in the Ninth Circuit, but you know the federal government opted not to get involved, uh, and the states sort of took, took it over. Uh, so yeah, there were four. There, there, there's, there's been uh, three of the four trials have been held, and necessity was not allowed at any of the previous trials, um, which is interesting. Speaking again to the idea that you know that, that, that as Jay mentioned that the uh, the lawyers really don't, <laughs> some of the lawyers, especially the, like the more tr traditional ones, are, um, are very hesitant to, to be associated with, with, with necessity because it does increase the risk. And so uh, particularly with Michael Foster in North Dakota, 
um, his lawyer was really focused on on just criminal defense. And uh, so, so um, in that case, you know, especially we, we were, um, I think the most limited presentation of what, why we felt that this action was necessary. Um, Emily Johnson, who, you know, kind of was really, has been a really big influence in my, my career uh, as a climate activist. I'm very relatively new in climate action. I mean, I want to make that clear that like, I have so much respect and appreciation and gratitude to, to Marla and Jay and people at Stan and uh, Ken Ward and, you know, everyone else I've had the pleasure of sort of um, getting to know who have spent just so much of their lives. And for me, this is relatively new. I, you know, being a parent um, really kind of like brought out that sense of uh, urgency around what, what we can do or what I need to be, to be able to do. And, you know, when am I going to, when I'm going to look at my, my children in the eye in 20 years or 30 years and they're going to, and they ask me like, what were you doing when all this was happening? And, you know, when we could have made a difference. And so for me, it really is like about a, you know, last three years or so of really kind of getting involved and, and still working at a job and trying to raise a family in Seattle. Um, but Emily Johnston, uh, you know, she, we were on the Arctic sunrise, the Greenpeace boat. She was giving a talk about, you know, necessity uh, this week. And one of the things she, she talks about is, you know, putting herself into this kind of risk where, you know, she, her and Annette are facing 10 years in prison. I'm facing five years in prison from my felony charges. Um, people have kind of, they, they kind of look at her differently. And it, it even without having had a trial yet, um, you know, people understand that Emily and Annette and myself and everybody have, you know, done these actions because we do believe that they are necessary. And just, you know, you know, in the court of public opinion, so to speak, in the court of our communities, that really makes a, a big impact. And, and Emily, you know, people kind of like consider her words in a different way, in a more thoughtful way, when they understand that she's like willing to put more of so much risk and so much for herself on the line for the, um, for the, for the, for the cause. So that I think, you know, irrespective of how, of the trial outcomes, uh, you know, it's just, is, is, is a very important, I think, um, outcome or effect. And, and for me, just, in, in, you know, helping myself recognize how necessary and important this is. I mean, you know, doing that action and standing there in those, in those, in the, um, you know, in, in Minnesota, in the fields of Minnesota, you know, watching these pipelines get shut off in real time. And it's like the mil the helicopters from the security companies are like swooshing around and uh, just, you know, that really like crystallizes and, and, and kind of puts things into like a much more real perspective, which is so valuable. Um, so we, the, the prosecutor obviously does not want us to go to, to present necessity. Um, the judge in the case, uh, asked us to come out. So we all went out there last summer and we presented. So the four defendants, uh, um, Steve Lipte, who is our videographer, he was also charged, uh, you know, for, for trespassing as a documentarian. And the judge wanted to hear from us why we felt we, you know, this, cause we had, we had filed a motion to present the necessity defense for the trial. And, uh, and so before that could proceed, you know, the judge actually had it all come in person and sit down and he, and we just basically gave, um, testimony to why, you know, why we felt it was necessary. And that was a really powerful moment, um, for the, the trial judge in a, in a county in Northwest Minnesota. It's very rural, you know, uh, Enbridge is the number one, uh, property taxpayer in the county. I think it's something like 12 out of the $18 million that they get in revenue come from the pipeline company. So if you think about, you know, the relationship of, and the dependencies of you know of these oil companies and these pipeline companies and these energy infrastructure companies with like the local governments, um, it's kind of remarkable that the judge was you know was willing as willing as as he as he has been to kind of consider this. So we just all testified to our own personal experiences and our concerns and and again to what Kelsey said. Um, I personally have not done every possible thing in the, for 25 or 30 years, you know, unlike Ken, perhaps, or Marla or Jay, um, you know, to try and prevent climate change through legal means. I mean, I've done some phone calls, I've gone to some conferences, I've gone, you know, or to some, uh, some uh, you know, hearings about 
you know, pipelines or whatever in the area. I've written to my legislators, you know, done a couple of the basic things. But really, I mean, for me, what I told the judge was after seeing the sort of very tepid response from the Paris Climate Accords, that was a very much of a, you know, a, a signal to me that like we've kind of ex we've sort of exhausted legal means, um, you know, existing means that, you know, it's like if, if the world's politicians meeting together are unable to come up with a set of guidelines that would prevent catastrophic climate change. And then after that, subsequently can't even uh, meet those on their own. What possible chance could, you know, could I have using legal methods? So I spoke to that and we spoke to some of our experiences of the science and the judge, I think, was listening and learning about that. And, um, and, I, and I spoke and I actually kind of, I teared up. I was crying talking about my children. And, you know, I think that that mattered. I think that the judge, when he, when he listened to me and saw me talking about like, this is something that will just, it's just heartbreaking to think about like what kind of world I'm leaving for my kids and there's just nothing that I can do and it feels so helpless. And, um, you know, I don't know what, what part or, you know, what all the factors, you know, that went into, into the judge's decision, but um, it did feel very empowering to be able to share that in that kind of a, in that kind of a legal context. The judge um, made the decision to allow the necessity defense. And uh, of course the prosecutor immediately appealed it. Um, we, and Kelsey can speak to some of this. I think she's been really, I think, you know, an important part of this, of this team. Um, but our, we have an excellent lawyer in, in, in Minnesota, Tim Phillips, who's just been really, really, I mean, he's an incredible, incredible person, you know, doing this work pro bono. And, uh, and then we also, so he filed the response, our response to the appeal or to the motion to appeal. Um, and we had an amicus brief filed on our behalf from, I think, several hundred law professors and, and lawyers. So very much like there's a lot of attention around the case. And uh, so that I think is, is, is an example of like one of the, I think positive outcomes that we didn't necessarily expect, um, you know, was to see these lawyers and law professors, you know, see this as a, such an important opportunity to kind of put, put climate on, the, on trial. Um, just I'll just get through the, 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 the timeline here and then I'll, I'll speak a little bit about um, why, why, you know, Emily and Annette and myself, you know, feel this is, and Steve feel this is so important. So uh, the appeal, the, the, the appellate court in Minnesota uh, came back and, and basically sided with the trial judge, which was in our favor, um, which was very good, you know, very good news. We were very uh, pr pleased to hear that. Um, but then, of course, the prosecutor immediately went and decided to spend even more taxpayer money uh, by doing a, an appeal to the Minnesota State Supreme Court. So that's kind of where we are right now is that we're, we're waiting, I think July 23rd, I believe, is the timeline for the, minute, the state Supreme Court to decide whether or not they want to hear the case. We hope, we hope they don't. We hope, we hope that they you know, just send it back to the, to the lower courts. In that case, then we can hopefully get this to trial because you know, as we all know, climate change is happening, it's urgent. We want to get a trial as quickly as possible. Um, so hopefully we can do a trial and, you know, end of summer or, uh, or in the fall. But if the Supreme Court does choose to hear the, the case, then it probably will be um, sometime next year. Uh, why is this important necessity defense? You know, why do we do it? Um, I think, you know, there is no question that climate change is happening and it's real and it's imminent and we feel felt it was necessary and the tar sands is some of the worst oil that's being extracted and it has some of the, the largest carbon emission footprints, not to mention the devastation that it causes to the indigenous communities um, of, Cal of Canada and to the, uh, to the wildlife there. Um, and this is a chance to take a trial and turn it from like a criminal defense trial about us to really about like this larger question of what of is this civilization, the very fundamental way that we power our civilization uh, acceptable. And that I think is just, you know, to the extent that we can have that discussion in, in court and to, to the extent that I've been able to be a part of that and that we can get you know, Bill McKibben and um, Jim Hansen, Dr. Jim Hansen, you know, to come up and other ex experts and physicists and climate climatologists and, and, you know, professors of social change to come out and speak and, you know, in, in, in an expert way, present their, their, their evidence and their testimony that, you know, this is necessary, this is happening, this is urgent, that, you know, that this is a viable way, you know, through civil disobedience to, to respond to it. Um, that to me, I think, you know, is something that when I do, you know, 20 years from now, 30, 30 years from now, when my kids 
are asking me, what did I do? I, you know, I feel like I'll, I'll, you know, this and among other things, there's so much, always more to do, but, but I will feel, you know, proud um, to be able to look them in the eye and, and, just, and just to say that I was a part of this. And, um, and I think that the, like Jay said, having this in the courts um, really helps to, to, um, to clarify that and to, and to add a sense of legitimacy to it. So thank you. Wow, uh, thanks so much, Ben. All four of y'all are, are, are super inspiring. We do have some questions coming from folks. Just a reminder, in the Zoom screen, if you're in Zoom, um, there's a Q&A folder down at the bottom. You can put your picture there. Um, and you can also put, I'm sorry, picture. Uh, you can put your question there. And on Facebook Live, you can put a question in the comment section. I, I have a bunch of questions of my own. Uh, we are gonna try to bring up Susan Redwick, but, but in the meantime, uh, one of the things that Ben just alluded to and that we started hearing back from uh, various uh, trials is this idea that you're supposed to have exhausted every possible means. And I'm, I'm looking at uh, Kelsey's list of four tests here, the serious and imminent danger, trying to prevent harm, but taking action through less harmful means, and, and the others. And Kelsey, could you talk a little bit about uh, what standard you're actually being held to about what you have to demonstrate you've tried to do? Uh, do you have to have done everything? Um, no, the person on trial does not have to have done everything. Um, I talked a little bit about this, but it definitely bears repeating because this is something that um, a lot of people get hung up on. And um, I think sometimes when we talk about it, it can kind of get ob obscured. Um, because sometimes we have defendants who have 30 year resumes of working on this issue. Um, and we do want to explain to the jury, you know, that they got to the point of breaking the law after they had done all these other lawful things, um, because that's relatable and it helps people understand how you decided that you had to do something different. Um, it kind of legitimizes it. But that is not the legal standard. Um, the, it's a misconception that the defendant has to have done everything or that they were part of a campaign that did everything. And we're talking about stuff, you know, like writing to your representatives or doing petitions or doing um, uh, protests and marches kind of short of breaking the law, anything like that. Um, and the actual legal standard is that there is no lawful, reasonable lawful alternative. Um, and that is uh, kind of objective. It doesn't depend at all on what the defendant has done. And this could be the very first thing that the defendant has tried. And if we can prove that it wasn't reasonable for that person to think anything else would work, then we've met the standard. And that's completely fine. Um, so this is something that, that as I mentioned, it's, um, it can be kind of a sticking point um, with prosecutors or judges. Um, the fact that what, what has the person done is a sticking point and also the definition of what a reasonable alternative is. Um, it's one that could realistically work, not just one that exists out there. Um, so when we had a, a judge say, oh, well, this defendant had lawful alternatives because they could have just run a campaign on TV telling people about the dangers of climate change. Um, you know, clearly people have tried that, right? Um, and even if they hadn't, at this point, we know that it's not gonna work. We can't out lobby the fossil fuel industry. Um, and so in terms of what we, what we do to kind of combat that, to persuade a judge um, what reasonableness is, um, we, we define it properly. So you have to have done your kind of legal research and um, show case law regarding reasonableness to show that reasonable alternative is meaningfully different from the alternative. Um, and then we also bring in expert testimony to focus the judge and the jury on the actual question. So we have an expert, for example, from Princeton to testify that the entities that have power over US government decision making are not regular citizens. They're corporations and the very wealthy and this person has studied those things. Um, so it's actually not reasonable to think that all these lawful alternatives will be effective in this situation. Oh, that's super interesting. Um, thank you. Uh, Susan Redlick, are you, are you available? Can we get you on video and microphone? Oh, we can start to hear you now. There you are. Go for it. Uh-oh. Hello. 
just once. Oh. Hey, Susan. Susan. Hang on. Hang on a second. I, I think um, there, there's, there's some awful thing. There's... Is anybody else getting that? Yeah. Okay. Susan, um, I, I saw your question. I'm going to try to ask it and maybe you go back on mute. Uh, it was very, very tricky to know what's happening. Cool. Um, sorry about that. I, I don't know what's, what's on, but I'll, I'll try to get your question right. And so, so that, you know, the, the question, uh, as, as I heard it or as I read it, was uh, how do you start your planning process uh, in this type of work? Uh, recognizing that necessity defense might be coming forward uh, later. When do, you, when do you actually integrate the idea that's happening? Is it getting around the time that you're thinking about being charged, as, as Jay was talking about, like stumbling on it? Uh, or is there, is there, are you structuring actions now so that you have a clear spot and you say, okay, we're going to be using, we're going to be making this action uh, in order to use the necessity defense. And so maybe, maybe Jay and Marla, both of you have been working on this lately. Do you all want to chip in? I have thoughts. And also, Susan, great to see you. Hope you're doing well. Um, you know, the thing about the necessity defense, what I love about it is it's actually a useful strategic analysis tool um, to ask whether we're doing a good action. Um, you know, when the standard is, is this literally going to be effective? One of the measures I think is about is, are we doing direct enough action? are we actually blocking something that matters or is this symbolic merely symbolic i don't want to i don't want to dissymbolism symbolism is critical but is are we doing something that is merely symbolic um, or are we actually doing something that is actually going to keep it in the ground literally um, so so that i think is all 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 of these are useful lenses it's a <laughs> have i done my homework you know, that's kind of the, the, the test around um, having exhausted or, or not found a reasonable alternative. Um, kind of similar to uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, first step in, in nonviolence, number one, assess whether, or second step, number one, assess whether there's an instance of injustice going on. And number two, uh, negotiate. And if the negotiations fail, then you move to nonviolence. So, um, I, I think they're they're useful questions to have a sieve, a filter through, uh, to to think about any action, whether or not you uh, are considering using defense. And I would just add some like practical examples of how. Um, so one example that was sort of accidental plan, like planning that really helped, and then another example of of deliberate planning. Um, so. Uh, so I don't know if this is necessity defense even as, as much as it is like thinking about the fact that if you get a jury trial, the jurors get to see lots of evidence. And so um, one of the things that, uh, so, so just thinking about what sort of evidence might be collected um, or available for use in your trial. Um, Abby Brockway in the Delta Five trial had um, a lockbox with her in her tripod that she could use if she decided to stay in the tripod for longer to keep blocking an oil train for longer. And um, it turns out that it was covered with um, like a letter from her daughter um, put on there with like clear tape and, you know, like a letter from her pastor. And that ended up sitting on the jury table during jury deliberations, right? Because it was in evidence. And so, you know, the jurors who came out and talked to us after that trial was over, um, who decided that they wanted to talk to the defendants, uh, were very clear that they spent a lot of time with that, with that piece of evidence, reading those, like, those important people in her life um, and a pastor, <laughs> you know, like, those people saying, this is important, this is necessary. And the other thing that I will say is that um, I, uh, I worked with someone who was going to do a climbing action who, um, who I just encouraged him to, you know, he was going to put his, his instructions for how to like, set something up while he was in his harness. And so he didn't fall. He was going to laminate those and clip them to his belt. And, um, and, you know, I encouraged him and I would encourage anybody to think about 
Um, is there anything that you want to have on you that you want to make sure that the jurors might get to see? Uh, whether that's a letter from your kids or from your pastor or your partner, I carry, just in case I need it, um, a letter from my partner that says to me how important he thinks the work that I'm doing is. Um, and, uh, and so I think um, those are the kinds of things you can ask yourself um, in, in addition to Jay's point about, about the sifting, but also if you're going to get to bring some evidence to trial, is there any kind of evidence that you think you would want the jurors in the jurisdiction where you're going to be to see? Um, one thing that Ken Ward had some success with, I think, in, um, in his Val Turner trial was the fact that um, he was allowed to introduce himself to speak to his, his own state of mind, uh, a sea level rise projection map for the county he was in, um, wherein the the oil uh, refineries end up looking like islands and the tulip fields that cover the county that are really the pride of the county, such that they have a month long tulip festival every year, those are underwater. Um, and so that was an important visual for him to be able to introduce. So anything that can, that you think might tug at the heartstrings of, of the people uh, who might be deciding the case, I think it's important to think about whether you're going for necessity defense or not. Awesome, thank you. Um, Kelsey, just a quick question there. Uh, before we, I actually have two questions for you. Um, first one is, is sort of a follow-up to that. Um, Marla has talked about the benefits of going to discovery. Um, what are the risks to activists of going to discovery is, is my first question. And the second one, which is from uh, Arlene on Facebook Live, uh, would like to know where else are we seeing the you necessity know, defense being used internationally? Cool, great questions. Um, um, first, I'm just going to chime in kind of on what Marla and Jay said in response to the last question. I think we are seeing people um, just thinking about using necessity defense earlier and um, like them, I think that that's good because a lot of things that you can do to set yourself up for it, uh, a good case are, are things that you can do early. Um, like you can know the law and the jurisdiction where you're at and at climatedefenseproject.org we actually have a guide to all the 50 states necessity law um, and you can start putting together your legal team early like before you get charged which is really key um, as people have talked about this is not a traditional defense so it can take time to find lawyers who are on board with it at all um, cdp might be able to help but we like to partner with local attorneys in the different jurisdictions we work um, so yes for all those reasons start thinking about it um, before you do the action. Um, in terms of discovery, um, I think the, the things that Marla talked about, about you know, being positive, like how you can get stuff into evidence, um, is the flip side of that is that it is very personal and it can be um, kind of emotionally exhausting to go through that process, both in terms of um, content that prosecutors might be trying to get, although I don't think we've so far come across prosecutors really trying to kind of get anything embarrassing or like, dig up dirt on people. Um, it's more it's more that it's a, a long process. Um, and that's why it's so important um, as, as Marla and others were talking about to really uh, have a supportive community around the case. And actually that's another benefit of starting to think about this early um, because, because these cases take so much work and so much time um, it's critical to have people around who can support the defendants, get the word out, build on the interest that these cases draw. Um, so I think maybe that addresses your first question. Um, and then, well, actually another good thing about discovery is that we get to do that too, right? So like Marla was talking about with um, the evidence that there's no safety plan, that they were lying about it. Um, I'd say that so far, we've been getting more information in discovery. Um, and that is that's very helpful a lot of the time um so in terms of international um we like i mentioned the uk case um, that was in 2008 uh climate defense project has been working on cases in canada uh the uk now and um, also australia things are kind of at different phases but we've been you know everything from con kind of consulting to um working on stuff going to court in those places. And um, it's pretty 
those places are easy for us because uh, they're all common law countries, so they have this common law necessity defense. Um, I feel like there may be analogs in other legal systems, but I'm not experienced with them. Um, and so those are the places that I know about. There may be others. Um, if anybody knows, let me know because I'm very, very interested in kind of the international angle on this. Cool. Th thanks so much for that. Um, uh, anybody else on the international? Have you seen other stuff happening other than what Kelsey just mentioned? No? Okay. So, so I, have, I have a question that uh, I don't want to get too far away from the, the legal. I, I'm not a lawyer myself, but I, I do a lot of lawyer adjacent work. I'm, I'm near lawyers class, and uh, as I, I'm pretty sure everybody else here is as well. Um, and when, when you look at law from the outside, it seems like there's this process of, of arguing on, on very specific legal points and whatnot. Um, but I can't help but you all are, are, bringing, are talking a lot about your faith in the legal system. And when I say your faith, at least uh, two of you identified as Quaker and Methodist uh, in, in your bios. And I'm, I'm really curious about the, um, uh, the actual, how you feel about it. Because it seems like you're, you're engaging with a system that is, I don't want to call it amoral, but it's an antagonistic legal system. Uh, and you are bringing with you faith and heart. You know, Ben talked about his very emotional response to testifying at trial, his, his, uh, his children. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, like, what does it really mean to actually try to bring your sense of morality and, and perhaps faith into the legal system? Any more? So, so I'll start. I'm sure Jay's going to have something about this too. Um, so first of all, like it's, obviously important to, to recognize that, that not everybody in this country um, receives the same sort of treatment, even if they do the exact same thing and they're in the, in the exact same courtroom, um, right? And, and so um, we should just go ahead and, and acknowledge that. And, um, but, but the next thing I'll say is that um, if you can get yourself all the way to a jury trial, so, so the, the criminal justice system is not, is not there's not a lot of justice there. Um, but I do think that there's something about a jury trial that it, that is one of the sort of like last possible vestiges of, of like real direct kind of democracy and, and opportunities for, um, for individuals in this country to like decide what justice looks like and what it means. And um, there was a question in the chat earlier about jury nullification, which I don't think we should go into very far. I said I would make sure that we got an email to that person. But, but you know, jurors have the right to make whatever decision that they think is the right one to make. They get really specific instructions from, from um, judges. Uh, but once they make their decision as a jury, they don't have to justify why they chose to, to rule as they chose to rule. And so um, one of the things that, um, so, so Jay mentioned earlier the, the, the fact that if, you, if you're going for this kind of trial, you're going for, to be in a vulnerable place because you're, you're gonna show up in court and say, hey, I did this thing. And in fact, um, they're probably gonna like play the live stream video that you recorded <laughs> while you were doing the thing. Um, and so, so the point, at, like at that point, you're trying to, you're trying to make sort of a, a moral and emotional connection with the people in the room. Um, and you're trying to make them feel powerful. And so one of the challenges that people often have with their attorneys in these situations, even if they really want to be good movement attorneys, is that their instinct is to really just try to minimize the, the harm to their clients um, or the potential, the risk potential. And they want to make juries feel small and, and argue these individual points or like argue technicality with the judge. Um, and what we want to do when we're mounting a necessity defense is make it really feel large and powerful. Um, and and I, I feel like when, when just the jurors that we've talked to after cases, like they're, they're prepared to and have made decisions on the basis of, oh, we understand why this is so important. And so I, I think there's something really valuable about the direct nature of being able to talk to a jury people who aren't specialists in the law about why something matters. Um, so that's why I think it's interesting and powerful. And, but I don't think it's worth doing if you're not willing to be vulnerable and trying to make that connection with people you might not normally connect with. Anybody else, Jay? 
Yeah, I'll just say quickly, I think for me, the, the reason that I was able to go into that situation was because I was a person of faith in that I didn't have to have any faith in the so-called criminal justice system. Um, it was placed somewhere else. And, and I felt clear um, that I was acting in the right. And, um, and my faith is, works in such a way occasionally that these moments come where I know that they could lock me up, they could haul me away, and they could not capture my aliveness, my soul, my spirit. And, and I'm, I'm convinced that that's part the transmission of that through vulnerability, the transmission to uh, both our movement, the people are moving in the courtroom, the people in the courtroom, the jury in the courtroom, and our broader movement and the public outside the courtroom, the transmission of that unbowedness, if that's a word, um, is, is part of uh, uncowedness is part of our, our work in going to trial because it, it, shows and demonstrates viscerally what it means to be committed, what it means to um, act reasonable, reasonably and commensurate with the scope and scale of the urgent cataclysmic crisis we're confronting. Um, and, and so that, that sense that I am in the right place, I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. And, and my faith is strong that is, is to strong to the point that um, they can't touch me. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Hey, um, I'm looking at the time. I see we have one more question in the chat that I'd like to put out there and then ask each of you for, for closing remarks. Um, so the, the question is, have you found international human rights law to be useful in any manner in this larger work? Um, she realized it's very broad. I was just, just curious to know whether any or all of various treaties have been constructive for this type of work. Perhaps, Kelsey? Sure. Um, so we are actually working right now on ways to kind of incorporate that into defensive clients in the U.S. Um, I think that it's de there's definitely useful from an organizing perspective in terms of kind of framing um, different rights. And then when you have people resisting and getting arrested, um, it can potentially, that can potentially be a hook to bring in conversations about uh, international law. Um, but I don't have concrete ways so far that that has really played out in the case we've been working on. But I think there's potential. Awesome, thank you. And so, uh... I know that we have, a, you know, a lawyer and organizers and people who take action, uh, and and it's really interesting looking at this intersection. So as, as we go to closing remarks, uh, I, I'd love to hear about any other thoughts um, um, from folks. Uh, so so Ben, why don't you go ahead and start with some closing remarks, and, and we'll move on through. Yeah, I think that I would just say, um, in in regards to the question about human rights law and international law, I think you know it's important to remember that like climate justice is sort of like this component or this piece of like social justice and you know like what's happening at the border and what, what happens with immigrants and with you know people of color in our country and with you know with women's rights all these issues i think you know are have like interconnections and you know communities of color tend to be impacted worse by climate change and are also you know negatively impacted more severely by like imperfections in our legal system so you know i feel like you know, you know that naomi klein kind of perspective about that like everything has to change um you know I, I think absolutely we can kind of like use the like indigenous like first nations treaties in canada and the and, and the u.s to like as important tools to kind of like shift the overall um dynamic of oppression in our society as a whole and i think that that can help with the climate along with everything else but um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. And just, you know, thanks for the time. And uh, I appreciate all the people from, for calling in and wanting to learn more about this. Um, I would say uh, the, the emotional toll, the, 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 <laughs> the years of trial, these are, these are um, definitely factors like, you know, be prepared for if you, if you are going to do an action, um, be prepared for, uh, you know, for, 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 for what could be several years of your life of like, 
sort of like this sort of uncertainty um, definitely can, can impact you along those kinds of lines. Um, and, you know, I think that deciding, you know, in terms of like whether or not necessity is an appropriate defense, I think it's important to think that like that might be a good litmus test for yourself to decide like what kind of action you're getting yourself involved in and, and you know, it's something that you want to commit to. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Uh, Jay? Thank you guys again for, for hosting us. Um, this has a, been a great conversation and I uh, just want to give a shout out to Abby Brockway who just sent me a little note. You were amazing. Um, um, you know, I think fundamentally civil disobedience, climate disobedience is about bringing the legal system, the law as uh, countries and nations understand it in line with moral law. So the the extent to which you can ground yourself in the clarity of of rightness and the clarity of um, your own reality that this is where you are supposed to be, you are a hundred percent here, uh, then you are a great candidate to go to go take that into the public sphere and to and to to put it on trial to talk to a jury. Um, and and I think it's it's completely I just want to say like it's completely legitimate and okay if the necessity of defense is not your path. Um, I think there's a lot of there, there's a lot of rhetoric that flies around um, as people go to trial um, or people to contemplate going to trial uh, of well if you're going to go to trial you don't know what's going to happen why don't you just take the plea deal so you can get back on the field um, and there's there's pros and cons to both of those things um, and and so deciding which is right for you as an individual uh, is a critical thing. The advantages to going to trial are the things we're talking about today, the public ability to tell a climate story in a way that doesn't happen in other circumstances. The negatives are, hey, like like Ben was saying, people get really wrapped up. The anxiety of the, the, the criminal system isn't necessarily about your trial. It's about all the stupid hoops and court dates and bullshit that, um, that you're forced to jump through um, to get there. And that's really in many ways the most trying part of being being on trial. So um, if you're ready, leap for it. If you're not, there ain't no shame. I wanna jump in on what Jay said there because I just wanna make it really clear that as hard as it's been, I would not change a thing. And this has been one of the most like gratifying and rewarding experiences in my life. So, but, but it, is, it is also emotionally uh, exhausting. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Marla, do you want to follow up the most trying part of housing on trial? That's yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so one of the things that I'll say is that I, I know that, um, that Ben's life and the lives of the Val Turner folks are easier than they could have been because Ben's partner, Nikki, has been um, helping to hold everything together and do some organizing. And so one thing that I didn't talk a lot about on this call that it is really important is um, if you are going to choose a, some kind of political trial, um, there is a lot of kind, there are a lot of kinds of organizing behind the scenes that, um, that might not be obvious. They're not just like every other kind of organizing. Um, and even managing your own folks at a trial, um, I've made a whole lot of mistakes over a lot of, I've already learned a lot of things the hard way. And, um, and, and uh, at the Climate Disobedience Center, one of the things that we like to offer to people if they if they want to work on it is to to say hey well we want to we not want to help you learn what we've already learned about about organizing for a trial and how to maximize it and like here are some things that here are some mistakes that you don't need to make and if you make some let us know so we can learn it to our, our pile of, of learning so so we're excited to work with people um who who are planning to go to trial the thing that i'll say about this is if you know you're planning to go to trial um it is almost impossible for defendants to be the people who are driving the organizing that doesn't have anything to do with lawyers. Uh, and so it's really, really important early on for you to find somebody who like loves you more than they care about this trial. Uh, and for those people to, to whether they're organizers now or not, um, 
help them learn how to do that organizing work for you because the defendants really should not be doing it. They have a lot of other work to do to prepare for trial. And um, Jay and I and others at the Climate Disobedience Center are excited to help you learn how to do that um, if you want our help. But really uh, put that to best use for organizing. And the one final thing that I'll say is that um, if we're gonna build a community of resistance, then we have to continue this journey that I think everybody here has already been on of understanding that um, that the, that we're not trying to build a culture of heroes, right? Like, um, there have been times in the past when people have been held up as heroes because they're the one who, ones who got arrested, maybe. Um, they did take the biggest risk, perhaps, but then also has charges, and he didn't necessarily take that, that valve turning action. He was there in support. Um, I think it's really important for us to understand that that the people who take the actions couldn't do it um, as, as well as, as they did without people doing the support work. And because the consequences are different for different folks and because we all have lives that, that um, are different at different points, uh, it's really important for us to understand that the people, like in West Rock Story, we always said the people on the sidewalk cheering for the people in the trench are just as important as the people in the trench because they help the people who drive by understand that what's happening in the trench is normative, it's important, and we have to, it's necessary. And so um, uh, my greatest joy would be to see us all um, embracing the entire group of people who are doing the action and supporting the action as, um, as equal and important parts of the work. Thanks. Oh, thanks so much, Mark. And Kelsey, you want to take us home? Sure. Um, well, I second what Ben said about situating this climate work in the context of social justice. I think that's really an important way to think about it. Um, and then I think another takeaway is that um, legal work, if, if attorneys do their job properly, but if we all work together properly, um, legal work can be part of the larger project of activism. It can result in change laws. It can legitimize protests. It can make our protests better. It can connect with people, all of these things. Um, so I really encourage people to not think of law as something separate from what we normally do as activists um, and to embrace it as a possibility for your campaigns and to embrace this, the concept of climate legal activism. Um, and I think that's especially important now, given that the other branches of government are clearly not responsive um, and there is really no kind of inside game there. We have protests and we have the courts and we need to combine them in order to be most effective. Um, and finally, I'll just say that if you want more info, there are a lot of tools available on the resources page at climatedefenseproject.org. Um, so feel free to check that out um, or yeah, to get in touch with all of us. All right, well, thank you all so much. I, I know Marla said it's not about, about heroes, but it's heroic action. And we, I know everybody on this call and all of us who got to hear you are inspired. So thank you all so much for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Matt and Anne. Have a great day.